So at this time, uh, Greg Bellingham is coming to lead us in a, in a couple hymns of the faith this morning, a few patriotic songs. Let's stand together as we worship him this morning. true that is his truth is marching on our next uh, patriotic hymn is going to be onward christian soldiers
and remain standing. We'll stay and stand, but we hope you'll stay. Anyway, Brother Jimmy Woods is coming to lead us in the Pledge to the Flag this morning. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Happy Memorial Day weekend. As we, honor, as we honor our war dead this weekend. This is a poem written by Sergeant Joshua Helterbrand. It's called The Final Inspection. The soldier stood and faced God, which must always come to pass. I think I was gonna cry. He hoped his shoes were shining just as brightly as his brass. Step forward now, you soldier. How shall I deal with you? Have you always turned the other cheek to my church? Have you been true? The soldier squared his shoulders and said, No, Lord, I guess I ain't, because those of us who carry guns can't always be a saint. I've had to work most Sundays, and at times my talk was tough, and sometimes I've been violent because the world is awfully rough. But I never took a penny <clears throat> that wasn't mine to keep, though I worked a lot of overtime when the bills just got too steep, and I never passed a cry for help though at times I shook with fear, and sometimes, God forgive me, I've wept unmanly tears. I know I don't deserve a place among the people here. They never wanted me around except to calm their fears. If you've a place for me here, Lord, it needn't be so grand. I never expected or had too much, but if you don't, I'll understand. There was a silence all around the throne where the saints had often trod as the soldier waited quietly for the judgment of his God. Step forward now, you soldier, you've borne your burden well. Walk peacefully on heaven's streets, you've done your time in hell. Okay, back to you, Jim. Shall I 
warrior soul. When it comes down to being a warrior, it is what inside the man that makes all the difference in the world. External strength and power, macho or not, is of little value on the modern, modern battlefield. What does matter is what's inside, the strength of character. What does matter is the heart and the sum total of all the choices that a man makes in his inner soul. A scripture's favorite description of the warrior is captured in the oft-repeated phrase, mighty men of valor. Valor is a matter of character. Webster defines valor as strength of mind and spirit. It is this soulish strength, this personal bravery, which enables a man to en encounter danger with firmness. It is the warrior's heart and soul which is the fountainhead of courage, sacrifice, and unselfishness. Such a spirit, so essential to the effective warrior, springs directly from his character, character that takes shape in the academy of discipline and sacrifice. The mission statement of the United States Military Academy nails the concept. Does it focus on physical strength? No. It doesn't even mention it, although, of course, West Point is well known for its rigorous physical training. Does West Point's mission statement center on the development of the mind? No, though no one disputes the superior quality of the Corps' academic program. The mission statement of the U.S. Military Academy, short and to the point, simply reads, it is the purpose of the United States Military Academy to provide the nation with leaders of character. A warrior without character is merely a brute. I shared this story a couple years back, but it bears repeating. This is the story, and this comes from a book. It's called Spirit Warriors, uh, written by Stu Weber. He, he parallels his combat service with spirit the spiritual combat that we go through. So it's, you'll probably notice some of the parallels in this. And I'll try to get through this story. <laughs> On the, it's a story of Doug Monroe. On that September 27th day in 1942, Doug had commandeered five Higgins boats, wooden flat bottom landing craft, to rescue a battalion of 500 U.S. Marines pinned down on the beach by numerically superior Japanese forces. The enemy strafing fire from
from advantage position had our Marines helplessly immobilized for slaughter. Directing his four boats directly to the Mar Marines, Doug positioned his boat his own boat in such a way that it acted as a shield between the Japanese guns and the Marines and their rescuers. Maneuvering his boat back and forth to draw the enemy's fire and rattling his own twin bow guns to suppress what Japanese fire he could, Doug managed to protect the operation long enough to complete the rescue. But the odds to which he'd exposed himself caught up with him, and Doug took several Japanese bullets through his body. His last words to his mates were about the mission. Did we get him off? Informed that indeed they had got them off, Doug simply smiled and died. Now here's the question to you, why? Why would a young 20-something man not that long out of high school, throw his life away like that? Why, with an entire lifetime to look forward to, love, marriage, family, career, would anyone expose himself to such certain death? <clears throat> I'll tell you why. He fought for a cause bigger than himself, bigger than his own life. This is, this is, this is the common theme in all of the storied legends of warfare. Most of those stories include long marches on short notice over impossible terrain without food or sleep to fight overwhelming odds. In those legends, it is the warrior's soul, a deep settled conviction in the rightness of his cause, willpower more than firepower, that propels him on the march and ultimately carries the day. The warrior's soul makes all the difference against long odds. Contrary to the common way of thinking, more than a few students of welfare have recognized the reality that right makes might. Half-hearted wars are seldom won. Men fight hardest and longest for a cause that flows out of a just and righteous warrior soul. The heart of a warrior is a muscular soul, a center of conviction that beats for a large and noble cause, a transcendent cause. We're talking about the kind of guy who knows he's one small part of something much bigger and is willing to invest in it, even to the point of death. And we have one last parallel for you. He will bring the spiritual war to a successful conclusion, and then he will bring his warriors home from every tribe and tongue, from every cemetery plot and isolated grave, he will rise, his, raise his warriors from the dead and they will come home. Good morning. Uh, if you're able to, could you please stand while the redeemed sings the Statue of Liberty this morning? to 
seated and I'm supposed to preach after all of that all right thank you guys the cross is our statue of liberty for there we have been set free from the bondage of sin and uh, we worship him today in spirit and in truth we thank God for America and we thank the Lord for the freedoms we enjoy and today I'm just going to uh, share with you by way of introduction um, a little bit of a series we're going to be entering into uh, this morning. And it, it kind of has a little fringe, if you would, on um, what, it, what it costs to uh, be a Christian, you know. And I think Christianity ought to cost you something. Sometimes we take it a little bit too casual and... We need to fight against that. We need to know that uh, our faith uh, began where Jesus laid down uh, his life. He gave us everything that we might be set free. And so uh, God spared not his own son, but gave him up that we might be forgiven. And, you know, in the days in which we are living in, uh, your, your faith just might cost you something. to take a stand for the Lord Jesus. And the cross is our statue of liberty. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be an American. Uh, I am humbled to be born free. But you know, there are people across the world who love Jesus just as much as you do. And they have never experienced what we have been blessed with in America. And sometimes we confuse the two issues. Uh, just because we walk with the Lord doesn't always mean the path is going to be smooth doesn't mean it's not going to be without hindrance or obstacle or opposition. And so standing for Christ has cost people dearly. People have been martyred for the Lord. And what an honor it is to not only give your life for your, for your country, as many have, but to uh, know that there's one who sticks closer than a brother and he laid down his life for us. 
And so I want to introduce you to a series this morning. We'll talk about it for the next uh, few weeks. Anyway, it's uh, fighting against casual Christianity, and that is almost a, a conflict of terms, if you would. You ever hear the phrase oxymoron? Well, this is one of those. There's a contradiction of terms here. You know, for, for a lot of people, Christianity has that mentality of a, of a country club kind of kind of thing. You know, we go to church, we wear our Sunday's best, we're worrying about where we're going to go out to dinner after, after church, and that's kind of what it amounts to. We check it off in a box. But you know, we're to be, we're to be Christians in the workplace. We're to be Christians in the schoolhouse. We're to be Christians in the activities of life. We're to take a stand for Jesus. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy things in life, uh, but you can enjoy things without compromising. You need to take a stand for the Lord Jesus and let your light so shine in such a way that all those who are in the house around you might realize that, that hope that, that comes from Jesus. We are living in a very dark time, aren't we? As a nation, we're living in a very dark hour uh, as a world and as a people. Uh, and uh, what a time for Christians to shine the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. And so it needs to be paramount. But you know, as much as this is a contradiction in terms, it is truly a reality uh, in, our, in our nation. Christianity, for many at best, is, is nominal. When you read God's Word and those who have come up through historical accounts, uh, Christians have had a pretty rough road. And Christians have paid a lot down through the years for naming the name of Christ. And if you stand for Jesus in a very dark world, in a very uh, desperate time, uh, you will experience opposition and you will even perhaps experience persecution. Uh, we haven't been given over to blood yet, praise the Lord, and that's one of the benefits of being born free and an, as an American and on the shoulders of those who have laid down their lives. But, you know, we are, we are not a, 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 a people that need to realize that uh, we're something special. There are people, like I said, all across the world that, that love God have stood for the cross and the things of the Lord, have suffered much, and they love him dearly. It just so happens that we are here where we have the freedom of religion and we can uh, have the freedom of speech. We, that's been tampered with a little bit. But, uh, you know, a lot of times our, our, our uh, um, persecution, sometimes we, we kind of get a little bit misled and, and we think that's persecution. Um, we haven't tasted persecution in this country for our faith. And uh, that doesn't mean we're exempt, nor does it mean there's not coming a day when that could be true. But casual Christianity, by way of introduction this morning, I want to look at it with you as a disease, as an illness. It is a condition of the heart. Now, as you remember, about 12 years ago or so, um, I had quadruple by bypass surgery, and I had a condition of the heart. I was welcome to the heart club, you know. Beverly's brother just joined the heart club this past week, got a stint put in. And uh, as you get older, the body just kind of interrupts life, and it talks back to you a little bit. Uh, but, you know, every day is a day of grace. Every day is an extension of an opportunity to serve the Lord and to uh, uh, do his bidding. But casual Christianity, those two words just should never go together. But in America, they have, it has found its way to be joined and not even with alarm any longer. But it is a condition of the heart that has produced the culture. You know, sometimes Christians, we have this idea that uh, it's going to be the, the road of least resistance. It ought not to be considered that. If you take a stand for Christ... You will suffer persecution. You will be misunderstood. You'll understand that this world is no friend of grace. This is not a popularity contest. Christianity is not for the weak. It is for those who have been instilled with strength. It comes from the Almighty and from, from, from His hand. And He is our source and He is our strength. You know, I, I, I like in Scripture how sometimes one sentence 
brings an entire summation of an individual's life. And there's several of those in Scripture, and I just want to want to uh, identify one of those uh, with you this morning for the sake of time. In Acts chapter 13 and verse number, and number 36, speaking of David, David, after he lived the will of God unto his generation, he went to sleep. Nothing casual about living God's will or living out God's purposes in our generation. And then we can go to sleep. But isn't that a beautiful statement about a, 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 a soldier of God, though he was one who uh, deeply sinned against God, but after was called a man after God's own heart? But yet we can, we can sum up his life in just that, that one phrase, and you can, and you can look you can look at other phrases of other men and women who, who walked with the Lord, and, and uh, um, the Bible speaks of that. And, and God walked, you know, with Noah, or God, God walked with Elijah. Um, let me share with you. We, we, we sang the song this morning about onward Christian soldiers. Paul to young Timothy and his mentoring of him to take the mantle and continue on. The, the cause and the purposes of God. He says, be a good soldier in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Or what, did, what dawned on, on, on Timothy when, when Paul used that, that wordage, if you would, or, or that vocabulary? It's kind of like, oh no, what am, I, what am I in for? You know, what, what's about to happen? What's going to be around the corner? Be a good soldier. Because you might have to stand and take the take the shots. You might have to stand and, and be a warrior. Uh, I, I think it was mentioned this morning, Jim read for us, about having, having courage. You know, having a, a courage that comes from within. It's not something that comes from without. But it's something that God gives us to be able to do all to stand in, in the evil day. And so we need to take courage. This, this thing called casual Christianity that is a, a condition of the heart it comes from the fact that the cross for many believers is in the shadows, on the back burner. And what needs to transpire for, for us in this generation and in this day is that we need to take the cross out of the shadows or out, or out of the, the background and stop treating Christianity as a religion of convenience. And we need to begin living in the shadow of the cross. And this casual Christianity that we need to fight against, this country club mentality. Could you just imagine with me this morning, if you were an individual who loved Jesus with all your heart, and you never ever got out of the third world country that you lived in, and one day you had the privilege of looking at a, a TV screen, and you could see projected from the United States of America or Europe perhaps about what other believers in other parts of the world were doing and, and, and living and worshiping. And those cameras would zero in on a, on a gathering or a, a religious service or a worship service. And these people in the third world country who'd never been exposed to what we take as commonplace each and every day gathering in a house of worship with a with a with a nice rug and chandeliers hanging from the from the from the ceiling and air conditioning going good and strong like it did last Friday night when we watched the Roe v Wade movie air conditioning works very well here by the way but could you imagine being that one in the third world country the one who loved Jesus with all their heart soul and mind too and zeroing in when the camera panned across the setting it would absolutely blow your mind. What is this hanging from the ceiling? What is all this luxury? What is all this that they have? These people who call themselves my brothers and sisters, all they have known and all you would know in that country is perhaps persecution or having to worship underground or all these kind of things. But let me share with you, those people all around the world that name the name of Christ and suffer deep persecution for their faith, 
They love him as much as, if not more, than we do. But they do not have this privilege. And so don't confuse the ground rules of faith with American privilege. Sometimes we, we, we talk about our rights as an American, and yes, you do have those. But when Jesus died for you, you were bought with a price and you surrendered your rights. And don't confuse your American rights with your, with your Christian beliefs. Because like I said, there are many around the world who love Christ as much as you do, or if not more, and they have never had a privilege or a right. I remember being at Thomas Road Baptist Church when I was in school at, at Liberty, and, and Dr. Falwell would uh, expose us to a lot of things just so that we would be enlightened. Oh, by the way, believers, once in a while, to get out of your comfort zone that produces casual Christianity that we need to fight against, you need to expose yourself to some things that are uh, hardships in other people's lives. You know, go, to, go to a nursing home or go to a, go to a, a, a rehab center for alcoholics or, or look at the battle lines that the, the people are, 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 are fighting through each and every day. Hey, you know God's covenant people, Israel? They're getting bombed now because we dare to withdraw our troops from where they needed to be. And now all hell is breaking out and young children are being buried, caskets being piled on top of each other. We need to fight against casual Christianity. And people who love Israel and support Israel will be a blessed people of God. And when America quits honoring the covenant that God put in place, we need to be very careful about what might be around the next corner. And so casual Christianity, a contradiction of terms, or is it? It is a heart condition. It is a problem. It has produced a culture because we put the cross in the shadows and we, we pull it out when it's convenient for us. We call it casual Christianity or, or Christianity of, or, or religion of convenience. But we need to live instead in the shadow of the cross. And we need to have a burden for, for, for lost people who have not come to know Jesus Christ yet. And uh, for those whom Christ died, to have that compassion and that, and that burden. The greatest need for the church is not to address the COVID vaccine situation or the COVID illness. The need for the church is to stand for Jesus in the shadow of the cross and preach the gospel and to teach the gospel. And I'll even go out on the limb this morning. I might get in trouble for this one. But God put it on my heart, and I'm going to share it. And I'll share it, to you, I'll share it with you this way. In the last 14 months or more, we have been so consumed, so distracted with something that has befallen the world, a real illness, and a lot of you here know what I'm talking about. You are sick almost unto death, and I'm not saying anything lightly about it. But it has been used vastly for a whole lot more than your healing. But my point is this, none of that. My point is this, an all-consuming situation that has enveloped America and has enveloped not only America but the world in many losses, many devastations, but I kind of wonder, I just wonder, have we ever, as God's people, been consumed with the gospel of Jesus Christ like we have with this stinking virus? Casual Christianity is a contradiction of terms. And if you take up your cross daily, there's a difference between being born of the Spirit and being a disciple of Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus not only means that you have experienced salvation, but you have been equipped to do the work of the ministry and to stand in the gap and to stand on the front lines and to know the world is no, no friend of grace. This COVID disease and illness 
has captured us, has divided God's people, has Christians coming against Christians. But let me share with you the staying power, the longevity of, of walking by faith is when we take the gospel more seriously than anything that can come against us. That is unity. As we spoke about last week, so much so much drive and emphasis on, on uniformity. And I thank the Lord for the Church of God movement that smelled that out and said that unity uh, or, or uniformity over raising human or, or, or man's standards to measure people spiritually. We need to kick that to the door and know that our unity is in the cross of Christ and the cross of Christ only. Take it out of the shadows, folks, and live in the shadow of the cross. I think as a church, we need to be representatives of Jesus. And the world is looking at the church. How are you handling the same thing that we're going through? How are you dealing with all of these different things in a hopeless world? What's different about you? People asking about the hope that is within you because they see the witness, they see the lack of fear, and they see faith and trust. It doesn't mean that we have ice water running through our veins or we don't get sick. Many of you here have been very ill and you have been prayed for and loved on and cared about. But has there ever been a time in, in our history where we were consumed and the gospel of Jesus Christ was paramount as much as something that has visited us in the last year and a half? I just thought I'd share that with you because it just kind of came to my heart the other day. And I think it has merit. And so David, again in the text in the book of Acts chapter 13, there was a comparison there being made where the Holy One will not be given over to corruption. Kind of all the, the giants of the faith all through Scripture are, are, are being compared you know, uh, um, Abraham was great, and wonderful. He believed and it was counted on him to righteousness, but there's coming a better one, a greater one. And all through Scripture that, that uh, comparison is made. But David, after he had lived out the will of God in his generation, he went to sleep. What a wonderful summation. I hope, I hope one day, because we take the gospel that seriously, there can be something just by way of a statement. We don't need a whole page of an obituary in the news, you know, shouting our accolades and, and, and shouting all of these accomplishments and all that. And by the way, it's very expensive in the Gazette anyway. Don't, you know, you don't need to do that. Used to, used to, be, an art, used to be an article of news. It used to be free. You know, now even, even the period or uh, uh, explana uh, exclamation point or something, that's a, that's a $10 bill right there, you know, kind of thing. But wouldn't it be cool? Ron Maines, born on, uh, uh, when was I born? Born on, uh, on November 21st, 1959. He lived the will of God in his generation, and then he went to sleep. Man, it doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't mean that we always got it right. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we didn't disappoint the Lord or, or didn't sin against the one who, who gave his life on the cross for us. But in our heart of hearts, that was our desire, and that was our longing, and that was our purpose. And that's why we, be, that's why we believe that, that life begins at conception and God's purposeful life in and through you, Christ living his life out through you, is that which happens when you're born again. You know, if you're here as a believer this morning, you have two birthdays. I can remember my, my birthday. I don't remember being there. My, my mother told me very truly that I was there. She, she knew all about that. But I, rem I remember as an 11-year-old boy coming to, coming to Jesus. 
It was in that little, it was in the church right next door to us here. That was why it kind of felt weird when we built here. You know? But I remember standing up that altar with my dad before he went home. Trustee of the church, been part of the church for years, realized that he was part of the church, but realized that he didn't have a, a relationship with the Savior. And it took his heart illness, and the heart illness took him. But oh, God is merciful and gracious, and he wasn't gone until things were right with God. But we need to answer that question this morning. Have we ever taken the gospel as serious, as seriously as we have taken this situation that has befallen us? And when you start seeing things through the, the scope of God's purposes, you will live the will of God in your generation. And that's what God asks of us, that we would allow him to live his life through us in our generation. And then when it's time, God in his infinite wisdom and by the way, you're invincible until God is done with you here. Ask this man. The world can count us out. Doctors can count us out. But God has the final say. We need to live the will of God in our generation. And then when God says it's time, you can go to sleep. And you don't need to spend money on that big old obituary. So the greatest need of the church today is to be overwhelmed with the gospel. It is still the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. It still saves to the uttermost. It still lifts people out of the, the worst of places and circumstances and places their feet on the solid rock. It is an experience of his mercy and his grace. God is mighty to save. compassionate heart that seeks after those who do not know Christ as Savior is the present and greatest need of the church. And that's why you're here, by the way. You ever notice that? When you came to Christ, he didn't take you home? wonder what that's about. Is that now we just kind of have, we can ride the wave of grace? And we don't have to be concerned about the lost? I'm in the family of God. I'm in the camp. I have a fire escape. I don't have to get caught up in the wheels or touched by other people's sin. I don't want to get dirtied by that. I don't want my theology to be tainted. But I share with you, and I submit to you this morning, that if you do church God's way, it's going to be messy. Nothing casual about it. You know who should be in these pews? People who are lost and dying without hope, that don't, may, don't maybe possibly dress as well as you do, or smell as good as you do, or have the hygiene that you do. They might have alcohol on their breath. They might have just come out of incarceration for killing someone or dealing drugs. But no one is beyond the reach of God if we take the gospel seriously enough and say in admittance and confession to a holy God that I don't know if I've ever taken the gospel as seriously as, as I have taken even this virus. And that is what produces casual Christianity when we take the cross out from the shadows and it becomes a religion of convenience instead of a religion of conviction. And it's something we must speak of and something we must say. And it might cost us our life. We're fearing the fact that the virus might cost us our lives. How about if we stand for Jesus Christ and that might cost us our lives? But oh, what a return on that one. 
By the way, you're in a win-win situation. Think of the worst thing that could ever happen to you. But you're on your way to heaven. I guess I was so very convicted by that. God, I had not even been thinking about that. But I'll tell you, in these last days, and oh yes, I believe these are the last days, I, see, I think what you're witnessing today is the, the precursor of what is just about to unfold. You see, the mentality is American Christianity. There is nothing American about it. We got to be careful with those lines getting blurred and crossed. The men sang this morning that our Statue of Liberty is the cross. I'm thankful to be a Christian in America. But there are people who love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their hearts, souls, and minds, and they have never experienced the American privilege. Your Christianity has nothing to do with America. Your Christianity has everything to do with the cross of Christ. And you know, that's kind of tough for us. Because that's all we know. And I get it. I fall into the trap all the time. But it's a trap. And it causes casualness over and around Christianity. Could you imagine living in those countries where there's ongoing and always persecution every day of their lives because they live for, for Jesus? There's nothing casual about it. Our inconveniences, we, we confuse them and we call them persecutions. Maybe, just maybe, God has allowed this unfortunate situation to visit us and many of us because we need to get the cross out of the shadows. And it needs to be paramount. It needs to be all-consuming. It needs to be the difference maker. We preach it. We talk about it. We need to be living the gospel in the workplace. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, you know, I might, I might get ridiculed, or, or I might be misunderstood. You see, that's what causes the mentality of casual Christianity. It's about us, and it's not about him. Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials or temptations of your faith. For as you endure them and as you go through that and Christ is being formed in you, he will bring you forth as gold. Oh, and by the way, this is just the introduction this morning. But I'd like to, I like to leave you with this uh, today. And it kind of goes along with Memorial Day. And it kind of... Um, really speaks to the heart of the Apostle Paul that there was no bringing those two words together, casual and Christianity. It wasn't even in Paul's vocabulary. It wasn't even close. Beverly and I read that devotional this morning in the Daily Crumb, or in the Daily Bread. And it, 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 it talked about somebody going through a very hard trial of faith and the person wondering... Is it all worth it? And you see, that's the wrong question. The question is, is he worthy? Not is it, is it worth it? Did I get that right? Okay. But let me read this text to you, and this is what we'll be looking at next Sunday. And it kind of goes along with Memorial Day kind of this, this attitude of fighting against casual Christianity and, and, and this culture that we have grown in America that has produced nominal Christians and, and um, lukewarm churches and uh, maybe not battle-ready, if you would. But here's the heart of the Apostle Paul in relationship to his kindred uh, brethren in, in Israel. I am telling you the truth. I am not lying my conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit 
that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Could you imagine? Oh, by the way, Paul never needed to be asked this question. Paul, do you take the gospel seriously? Do you take it as seriously as everything else you've had to experience in life? Where I could wish that myself were accursed and separated from Christ, which is impossible, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises. Whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever? Amen. You see, Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, educated by the best of the day, Roman citizen. Jew above Jew, one who could take his notebook against your notebook and he would be superior every time. Counted it all dung that God would be glorified. Imprisoned, shipwrecked, beaten, harassed. Name the list. Persecuted, all these things. And he counted it joy and glory because the one who hung on the cross for him and delivered him out of being a murderer of Christians a persecutor of the church he said worthy worthy is the lamb and what a privilege it is to be named as part of the family of God have we ever taken the gospel so seriously that it is all consuming that I wish that I could be a curse from God for the salvation of this lost and dark world and community and I think and I believe that when that occurs among God's people you'll have to build another building but I'm not going to be here to do it with you. No, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, I'm serious about that. I'm, th I'm saying if we take the gospel of Jesus Christ as seriously as it is prescribed in Scripture, there is no telling the move of God's Holy Spirit and Christ's life being lived out through the lives of those who name the name of Christ as surrendered instruments of God's grace. You talk about living with an expectant heart, you talk about seeing salvations, you'll just be overwhelmed to the point where you'll stand and say, his grace is absolutely amazing. Father, we praise you and we thank you this morning. We celebrate America. We celebrate those who laid down their lives and never took off their uniforms died in the line of fire, died on the battlefield, gave all that up that we might have these enjoyable freedoms. But I thank you, Lord, even more so for the Statue of Liberty for Christians, the cross of Jesus, upon which hung the sinless Son of God, slain before the foundations of the world and is still mighty to save through the death, burial, and resurrection of that finished work in obedience to the Father, now seated at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for us. O oh Lord, may we not just take the cross out of the shadows when it's convenient for us, but may we live in the shadow of the cross and as we think, and as we live, and as we have interaction with, with others, may it all be in mind of the cross 
and the difference that is made. What a privilege it is to speak the word of truth, to live it, to acknowledge it, to demonstrate it. And oh, what a privileged church it is when people look at us and see the witness. Oh, how they love one another because we have experienced your great love when you spared not your own son. I thank you that you demonstrated your own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Oh God, may we be a unified people. May we be a people that have no argument over the fact that the gospel is paramount. It is our life's breath. It is our message. It is our heart. And that we would be willing to lay down our lives, a curse from God for the salvation of others, because we speak from a heart of experience of what it means to be redeemed. As Paul never got over his salvation, may we never get over the mercies of God that are new every morning. Oh God, may we be unified in your spirit to the point that we're seamless. That Father, when one hurts, the other hurts. We esteem one another, we honor one another, and we do it all because you have blessed us beyond measure. You've given us a country of freedom, founded on religious freedom. Oh, Lord, that curtain may be closing in these days. But many who have walked the walk of faith for years in their whole lives know, know nothing different than persecution. And they love you as much as anyone ever did. We thank you, Lord, that we can love you because you first loved us. Unconditionally, willingly, knowing all about us, and still giving your son. If there's anyone here today, you're not sure that if you were to breathe your last breath that you would be in the presence of God, honoring him and thanking him for all that he has done. Maybe the cross has been just something historical. Maybe the cross has just been something in the shadows religiously. But you've never come to a point of meeting him personally and asking forgiveness for your sin and knowing that he died for you and that you can live for him and then you can have right standing with him. Are you here today and I can pray for you on this Memorial Weekend? Maybe you've had a lot of other statues, other idols. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto myself. In church, we need to be able to lift up that mantle, that there is no question about what we are consumed about and with. Are you here today and you've never received him as your Savior and your Lord and your Redeemer? Can I pray for you today? No one looking around, just raise your hand. God will see your hand. Anyone here, you're not sure, but you want to be sure. Jesus died on the cross that you might be forgiven. He wants to give you life eternal. He wants to give you right standing before a holy God who you could never stand before. All because of Jesus. All because of that sacrifice. And Lord God, I pray today that you would dismiss us with your blessing, birth in us a thankful heart that overflows so that others would even see it and ask of the hope that's within us. May we go from this place rejoicing and may it be said of us as it was said of David after he lived out the will of God and the purposes of God in his generation. He went to sleep. Oh God, may that be said of us as individuals, as part of your family, the true church. May it be said of us, we lived out the will of God.
before our generation. And now, we can sleep in Christ. Rest in Him. Help us never to take this task as a casual assignment, but as soldiers of the cross. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we give you thanks, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. And may God bless you.